It's the Mustang Insider Show presented by Cal Portland, the largest building materials company of cement and construction material products on the West Coast. Now, here's Chris Sylvester, the voice of the Mustangs. This is the Mustang Insider powered by Cal Portland. Do we put the finishing touches on the 2021-2022 Cal Poly Athletic Year? I'm Chris Sylvester, happy to be joined by Cal Poly Director of Athletics, Don Oberhelman, live from Cal Poly, the beautiful campus in San Luis Obispo, just had graduation over the weekend. Uh, the town gets a little more quiet this time of year for a few months, and then everybody comes back. We start sports again in the fall, and it'll be here before you know it. But we want to recap the year that was in Cal Poly Athletics, uh, uh, multiple championship teams, a lot of big moment for individuals that were named to all American teams. Lots to get to. Don, uh, as you look back at 21-22, and I know you're still working, the offseason is a little different for you. I don't even know if we can call this portion of the year the no. offseason for somebody in your <laughs> position. But uh, what are some of the, the better things you look back at when you think about 2021-2022 for Cal Poly Athletics? You know, there, there's, a, there's been a lot to celebrate this year. Um, you know, it's it's been an up and down year. It's been a roller coaster of a year. You know, still the the word that shall not be named, COVID, um, still kind of coming out of the, the the fog of that. So proud of our student athletes and how they kind of endured uh, through all of that. It's it's been a problem around the country, not just at Cal Poly, but um, just the way they kind of powered through and stayed focused to win a number of conference championships for us. Uh, we were in the hunt for the Big West Commissioner's Cup right up until the, the last, the last uh, sport. So I, I'm very excited about the year. I think we got a lot to build upon. Um, you know, hoisting some trophies has been a lot of fun, but academically, you know, we just got our, our graduation rates and our AP, no, APR numbers in, academic progress rate numbers in. You know, they're, those are the best that they've ever been. So I think we got a lot to be excited about and a lot to celebrate with, uh, with our students. It hasn't been a, a year in, in short of uh, busy hires and, and busy moments for, for you and your staff trying to find the right people, the right fits for Cal Poly, right? Cal Poly proud. There's a certain type of way to do things at Cal Poly that maybe differs from not only other schools in the Big West and the Big Sky and the Pac-12 when you're talking about wrestling, but really, when you look at Cal Poly, you know, from coast to coast, this is a unique place when you mix the academics with the athletics. Uh, academics are so important here. And you just mentioned those graduation and, and APR numbers being at their best following the 2021-2022 athletic year. Let's go back to, to late 2021. Uh, Steve Sampson, who has had a tremendous career in this sport, uh, even at this level, uh, with, with Santa Clara back in the 90s and doing what he's been able to do at Cal Poly. Obviously, all of his work speaks for himself at, at the professional level. But he decides to hang it up. You open up a national search, and a couple months later, he's still your guy. He comes back. <laughs> Tell me how that all came to be. Yeah, that was, that was crazy. There's uh, proof that you never know, you know, you always – you're always going to see something you've never seen before every year. And I think, you know, Larry Lee says that about baseball and every game you see something you've never seen. And, and, and I think for that, that was something I'd never seen before. He um, kind of surprised me when he came in and said that uh, he was, uh, he, he had some, you know, back issues requiring some, some pretty intense surgeries that were coming up and just decided you know, he, he wasn't going to be able to devote the time to it that he thought. So I start a national search, waste uh, quite a bit of time going around the country and interviewing candidates and kind of start getting my list whittled down to a couple of a uh, couple of couple of guys that I really liked. And then uh, Steve uh, had some further, more in-depth conversations with his doctors, uh, with me, um, thought about it and decided that, uh, you know, if, if we could allow him a little bit of time in the summer. To heal up, he'd come back stronger than ever, and we'll we'd be fools to not want him back on the sidelines. We'd be fools not to want him on the pitch, you know, every day at practice. Um, he's one of the finest communicators I've ever met. He's he's a tremendous leader. Um, I, I I can't imagine what it must be like playing for that guy and just being able to soak in. He's 
the way he communicates is un very uncommon. I can say that you don't see too many coaches that can do what he does. So what a blessing to be able to welcome him back. Um, you know, it wasn't some sort of change of mind or change of heart. It was more better information than expected on what his outlook is going to be post, uh, you know, on his back. Um, and just kind of the decision that, yeah, I'd really like to keep doing this. The only reason I wasn't is because I, I didn't know that I didn't think I could dedicate the time to it. And once he found out he could dedicate the same time, he's all back in. So that had all of us awful excited. The players were awful excited. Um, when we announced it via Zoom with the team that he was coming back, you could see this just like you could see in the squares on the Hollywood Squares screen of Zoom that you could see the stress leaving the bodies of, of uh, the players. They were awful excited to see him come back. So never seen that before. I've, others have gone through that, but I have not personally seen that uh, during my time here. Yeah, so if you if you hibernated through the winter and you woke up, you wouldn't have thought anything changed with the men's soccer program. Steve Sampson yeah, is, right. is still at the helm, and, and I'm sure there are some pretty high expectations coming off of last year. Uh, a first full legit offseason for a lot of these coaches for the first time since 2019-2020. We're chatting with Cal Poly Athletics Director Don Oberhelman. That wasn't the only search, uh, and uh, you're still in the midst of a couple of them. But at the end of the women's basketball season, after a quarter of a century, Faith Mimna decided to call it a career. She had so much success at Cal Poly and really helped build that program into what it is today. And they're not too far removed from contention in the Big West. Remember, they've been at the top of the pack uh, many times in the last decade. Of course, that 2013 NCAA tournament year as well. But uh, it was time uh, to, to hire a new women's basketball coach after Coach Mimna decided to retire at the end of the season. And so you and your crew went out and searched. Of course, you had the men's basketball search in early 2019. A few years later, you have the women's basketball search. And at the end of it, you came away with Chanel Styers, who was a fantastic player at Kansas State, uh, went on to play professionally here and overseas, had a ton of experience on D1 benches as an associate head coach, as an assistant, most recently as a head coach at Division II Cal State East Bay, not too far from here, had a ton of success there, and uh, she was your gal for the position. How, how did that search go, and how did you land on Chanel Styers? Yeah, that one was, uh, you know, they're all, you never know how the search is going to go. You never know where it's going to take you, um, you know, and, and for that one, uh, Carrie Mendoza, who's our one of our senior associate ADs, she's got um, responsibilities in women's basketball. The two of us went to Minneapolis for the final four and holed up and brought, you know, 25, 30 different candidates in uh, to meet with us, um, almost like speed dating, just rapid fire, spending as much time with them as we could. But it goes quick and it's a long day. And, uh, you know, her her infectious enthusiasm and energy um, just seemed like exactly what our program needed right now. Um, you know, Faith had been at the helm for a very, very long time. Lots of success. I'm still convinced the year that uh, COVID shut, shut us down in the Big West tournament, we were absolutely rolling through that tournament like a steamroller. Um, I think we beat Long Beach by like 35, and it could have been 50 if we wanted it to be uh, in that second round of the tournament. We were absolutely annihilating everybody at the end of the year. Um, and we got shut down. And then unfortunately, two of our best players, one turned pro and the other one uh, entered the portal to go to Purdue, uh, where she had a great year also. Um, you know, that that hurt our season this past season. And I think Faith just kind of felt like the timing was right uh, for her. I'm, let me say this about Faith. She is the finest example of a servant leader I've ever seen in my career. Um, you talk about somebody who dedicated her life and career to the betterment of other people. Um, from that standpoint, I'm going to miss her tremendously. Uh, she's, she was great for our department, great for our teams, great for our other coaches, just tremendous in all, all aspects. Now we bring in Coach Styers, a little bit different approach to things, a lot different energy. Um, I think our offense and defense are going to look a little bit different. Uh, practice looks a lot different already. Uh, I can hear her down the hall, you know, her offices, let me think one, two, three, do three doors down. Uh, and I already heard her twice this morning, you know, <laughs> down there talking to people. It's it's uh, she's a presence. Um, she's a leader. Uh, if, if I had a 17 year old daughter, I would be uh, smitten with this coach when she walked into my living room 
just about how she's going to make my daughter a better person and a better player uh, and a better student. She embraces the academic piece of the puzzle here for sure. That's something that she was craving kind of like I was when I settled on, you know, the places I wanted to look at, the places I wanted to be as an athletic director. She had the same thoughts uh, as head coach. Just said this is, this is exactly what she's been looking for. Uh, I did work with her uh, back at San Diego State for a couple of years and saw her in action as an assistant coach. I think she's had some amazing mentors, some amazing experiences. Uh, she actually was a uh, world-class thrower in track and field at Kansas State for Cal Poly's own J John Capriotti, who recruited her to Kansas State at that time. Um, she's Her playing experience is unparalleled. Her stories are tremendous about you know, what she's been able to accomplish. Uh, I, I just I can't wait to see what's going to happen here these next couple of years with her because I, I just see a lot of fun ahead. You know, every time she walks in my office, uh, when she leaves, we're both laughing hysterically at something. Um, and that makes it a lot of fun, you know, for, for not just student athletes, for all of us in our department. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll say that. Yeah, certainly a different type of buzz surrounding that Cal Poly women's basketball program. And I think a lot of folks are excited about what's to come when that season tips off later this year in November. Now, uh, those are the two searches you had in the midst of the athletic year. Now that we've reached the summertime, uh, you have a women's tennis opening. You have a women's golf opening. And, and of course, a director of track and field uh, to replace the late Mark Conover, who had such an impact for you know, two decades on the Cal Poly uh, Athletics Office and you know, faculty program, everything involved with Cal Poly athletics. Uh, wh where are you at with those right now? And, and what's on the agenda? Does, does one take priority over the others? Or how are you, how are you juggling and balancing all these things while trying to enjoy the, the beautiful San Luis Obispo summer? Well, there, there's not going to be much enjoyment for a little while until we get these things wrapped up. And we, we've got a number of other searches going on. And it's it's not really unique to Cal Poly. It's not unique to athletics with what's going on around the country. It's There's a lot of open positions. Um, I think we have about eight or nine open positions right now that we're, we're having a hard time filling some of those. Head coaching positions are different, obviously. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about those three positions. So Mark Conover passed away. Um, I, I just can't say enough about that gentleman um, what he meant to our program, what he meant to our students. Uh, another thing I have never faced before is the, is the, is the passing of a, a head coach and having to inform the team about it um, probably will go down as one of the more challenging days of my career. Um, you know, but we're, we're, these young people are resilient. We're, we're going to move on. We're going to be, uh, he put our feet on a pathway that, of, of competing for championships every year. Kind of a rough season this year for both track and field and cross country, but I think we all have to understand what was going on um, and accept, you know, they, we did our best with, with the circumstances that we had. Um, that said, our trajectory is going to continue to go on the upswing. This is going to be a highly sought after position. Um, this one, and because of Mark's influence on it, it's a highly sought after position because we're good. We're pretty good. Um, we should be winning the league every single year in the distance in cross countries, both men and women. That should be just be an afterthought for us. Um, and when when Mark's illness started, we we were no longer doing that every single year. So we need to get back to that. And I think we can do that pretty quickly. Um, track and field kind of similar in my approach. We should dominate distance, middle distance and uh, uh, steal some points on the hurdles and jumps uh, and dominate in the throws as well. And we should be winning the league pretty much every single year on both men and women in track and field. Uh, all that said, you know, that search is kind of going down the pipe first just because it was the first one that we started. Um, so we've been engaged in this one for about three weeks, four weeks now. Um, should be wrapping up soon. And then the golf and tennis positions, both of them are a bit of a surprise, but it really shouldn't be when you have you hire really, really good people. You shouldn't be surprised at their success and you sure shouldn't. Certainly shouldn't be surprised that uh, their success raises eyebrows from other people around the country. So they both uh, left for other positions, uh, one to Washington State um, and one to St. Mary's, which admittedly isn't a career move. That was a family move uh, for Kat, our head women's tennis coach. She was amazing, did a tremendous job, won us some conference championships. She'll do the same for St. Mary's for sure. Um, but this is a much better program than it was when we hired Kat. 
and she made it a better program. So I'm excited to see what the Canada pools look like for those. And we're going to move as quickly as we can. Uh, those searches can come really, really quick. And once we identify a couple of candidates, we'll try to make our decisions uh, very, very quickly. Obviously, there's a lot of other people like the president that will be involved in those selections. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's ultimately going to be my call. And, and uh, I'll go as quick as I can because we our young people need that direction. So I, I, this can't go on into deep summer. It can't be July 30th and we're still engaged in the search. We got to get these wrapped up. Don Oberhelman, Cal Poly Director of Athletics, is with us on the Mustang Insider, powered by Cal Portland. <clears throat> I want to get your thoughts on uh, something that happened in the spring, uh, baseball. Uh, baseball wound up having one of their better years uh, in Division I, um, 28 years as a Division I program. Only the second time in Larry Lee's tenure that they've won 37 or more games and not been a part of the postseason. And the only other time that happened was way back in 2004 when they won 38 games, but they did finish under 500 in the Big West that year. That wasn't the case this year. They, they really dominated the Big West. They only lost one series to a Santa Barbara team that I think was underseeded in the NCAA tournament. And the Big West, which had two preseason top 25 teams, only wound up being a one-bid league this year. Cal Poly... They wound up winning 13 of their last 14 games. Usually, if you finish strong like that, you'll get a little more uh, looks from the committee, right? I mean, it kind of it's like that in college football. You want to suffer a bad loss in week two, not week 11. And for Cal Poly baseball, sure, they, they kind of limped out of the gate. I think they were 7-9 and nine to start the year. They, they had lost that uh, first series at home to Washington, a couple of one-run losses that could have easily been the other way around. Uh, and then had, had that split against Harvard. But uh, as per usual, under Larry Lee, you get to the Big West, and this team does nothing but win series, win baseball games, and finish at or towards the top of the conference. 37 and 21, 16 games over 500 with two All Americans, two potential first round picks. But the RPI, which for whatever reason is the, the deciding metric and factor for the committee, never really gave Cal Poly a chance. Uh, your thoughts on what transpired with Cal Poly baseball. And uh, I think you, you said to me that you felt like they got snubbed out of a postseason bid this year. Yeah, I, I, I got a lot of frustration with the, uh, <laughs> got a lot of frustration with the NCAA as a whole, but uh, the baseball committee, I, I was pretty frustrated with because it, my point is, if, if all you're going to do is look at the RPI for your largest, why do you need a committee? Just let the computers pick whoever's not an, an AQ, pick all those higher um, seeds and or those higher um, RPIs and go. But you guys are supposed to actually be smart and actually look at the teams, look at the trends, look at the patterns, look at the players. Um, West Coast baseball is really, really good. The, one of the problems is for us, East Coast can go to the central time zone pretty quick and vice versa. Um, for us, we got to travel across the mountain time zone to get to Texas and other places to get those RPI games. So it's a little bit more of a challenge for the West Coast team. So basically what we do is we isolate out here on an island and just continue to play each other. And nobody's RPI moves much. Um, you'll notice the West Coast teams, there weren't a lot of them in the tournament. I think we had two, two host sites in the West and that was it maybe. Um, that's, that's not good. That's not appropriate. Um, so one of the things I think we need to do is start, we need to get on an airplane more often than what we have been. Um, the bottom four teams in the big West got to get it figured out. Um, those, those RPI games kill us when you're in the big West and we're playing, you know, Santa Barbara, Long Beach, Fullerton teams, that are supposed to be really, really good. And they weren't this year, which is unfortunate, uh, except for Santa Barbara, obviously. Um, we need them to be good. And then we need the bottom half of the league to really start figuring out what they're going to do with baseball. Um, I think we've got a school, a couple of, couple of universities just kind of have it. And your RPI is 280. How can you have an RPI 280 uh, recruiting out of Southern California? That just doesn't make much sense to me. Um, I think we've made investments in baseball. We've made investments in our facility. We've made investments in scholarships and our coaching staff. Um, we are doing what everybody else I think needs to be doing. Long Beach is, is picking it up. Uh, I would say they had a disappointing season. 
Fullerton had a disappointing season. Uh, those are two programs that are pretty rich in history and tradition. But to be honest, Cal Poly, we need them to be good. We need them to be RPI top 50 when we play them instead of RPI 150. Um, so I, I sent a bunch of materials to the committee. Um, at the time, we hadn't lost. We'd, we'd won uh, the second game against Hawaii. I think at that time, we were on about a 14-game heater and explained that to them. Um, the only conference series we lost was to Santa Barbara, which in my email I said, and Santa Barbara is Omaha good. And I still believe that they were, even though they didn't make it, they are Omaha good. We've had worse teams out of the Big West make Omaha than what Santa Barbara was this year. They were really good. Um, so I, I just kind of feel like the committee actually needs to do some work instead of just looking at one spreadsheet with the RPI on it. Do some work. Watch the team. Who do they have in their dugout? Um, what's their roster look like? How did they start? How did they finish? Exactly what you said. We're on a, you know, we finished strong. I would think you'd want that. I would, I would say our team was not scared of anybody heading into the postseason. Let's play. You got two potential first round draft picks. Is, it, is there any other team that has two first, two potential first rounders that weren't in the postseason? And I, I look, there's absolutely not. Um, there's only about three other, four, I think four others that had it and they were all in. Um, the tournament with a couple of them on the way to Omaha. So it's frustrating. Um, another knock on the NCAA. I just don't think they're doing this very well. Yeah, uh, Cal Poly baseball, like you said, uh, won 13 of their last 14 games, only lost one conference series all year, and for the season only lost three series over a 59-game schedule. I mean, that that's really impressive what uh, Larry Lee and company were able to put together. Obviously, the expectation and the hope was to get to the postseason, but uh, still a lot of success, 37-21, and 21, the final record with a, a sole possession of second place finish in the Big West. I mean, Santa Barbara only lost three Big West games in a 30-game conference schedule. That We haven't seen anything like that in a year. I mean, Irvine was really good last year, but not even they were putting up numbers like what Santa Barbara did here in this 2022 season. Uh, a lot of the talk down the stretch because Santa Barbara had seemingly run away with the conference with about a month left in the Big West schedule was, hey, you look around, Big West is the only Division I conference without a postseason baseball conference tournament. D1 Baseball, which does a, an excellent job of covering the sport, uh, had an article uh, from Mike Rooney, who, who's an analyst for ESPN and and also does some work uh, with, with the College Baseball Committee. and. Uh, from, from what that article posed was that the Big West was aiming to become a basketball conference, and what they really should aim on is uh, competing in baseball. Like you said, the rich histories of Cal State Fullerton and Long Beach State, and even more recently, the last decade, the success that Irvine and Santa Barbara and this Cal Poly program have had. So what are your thoughts uh, on the, the current Big West regime and, and what their focuses are, and, and might we see a Big West tournament in baseball sometime in the near future? Yeah, I think it's going to happen. What I don't think you'll see is a full uh, everybody invite kind of tournament. I think you'll see a four or a six team tournament. Um, I think it's it's time. I've resisted it for a while um, just because we always want to protect our, our higher seeded teams. Why would we put a three seed or a third place Big West team that's on the bubble of getting in the tournament and we open them in the Big West tournament against an RPI you know, 305 team, they win the game, but they still drop and now maybe they're not on the bubble. So it can also work against you when you do it. But I'm, I'm being a little bit selfish when I look at it. How many times have we finished second in this conference and not been in the tournament? Uh, and it's been a lot since I've been here. There's been years that we finished second, they've taken one and three. There's been years we finished second, they've taken one, three and four. Uh, baseball in the Big West should be a multi-bid league. Um, there's uh, with with the Power Five spending what they're spending on on the other sports now, they're they're realizing that their their feet are getting held to the fire. They can't spend every penny on football. Um, that gets you sued. So they've they've invested in these other sports. Uh, so you've seen the SEC get really really good in some of these sports that used to be dominated on the West Coast, like volleyball, like baseball. Um, there's no reason though the Big West can't continue to be a multi bid league in baseball and other sports like volleyball and softball. Um, but we've we've got to pick it up on the bottom end, and I think it's time for us to have a postseason tournament where maybe we can steal a bid because if Santa Barbara 
let's say loses to us in the Big West tournament, they're they were in. Um, it was weird that they were seated where they were, but at this point, there's no difference between a two and a three in the regional, so it really didn't matter that much. But um, we're we're not respected right now as a league nationally for sure in baseball. Um, one of the ways that I think we can we may be able to to do some things, make some hay, as Cal Poly is. Let's go play that tournament. Because again, we weren't scared of anybody. I'd have loved to have had another crack at Santa Barbara in that tournament. You called those games. I think in two of the three, we were tied going into the ninth or had a lead going into the ninth. Um, they're a good team. Don't get me wrong. They're very, very good. They, they, they proved that time and time again throughout this league. And we dropped some games that we shouldn't have. Dropped one to Riverside, dropped one to Long Beach. Uh, um, there's a couple of games that we just we let get away from us, UCSD that uh, Santa Barbara didn't allow to happen. Um, so I think the tournament's coming. It's just a matter of when. I, I doubt you'll see it this coming in spring of 23, but certainly by spring of 24, I think that's a real possibility. I think what's got to get sorted out is where is it going to be. Yeah, and even though you probably say goodbye to Brooks Lee and Drew Thorpe, uh, there's a lot of talent returning for Cal Poly in the 2023 season. And, of course, you have the quick fix in college athletics these days, and that is – the transfer portal, uh, in your experience as an athletic director at Cal Poly, how has the transfer portal hurt and or benefited you guys as a whole when you look at uh, sports like volleyball and men's and women's basketball and even football, baseball? Yeah, I, I think it's it's probably been a net neutral so far for us. Um, you know, certainly we've had some people transfer out, but we've also benefited from having some people transfer in. So. You know, I, what I don't like is it, it allows people um, – what's going to happen is you're going to see some coaches, particularly in basketball, that just stop recruiting out of high school because um, you're going to see 50% of the high school – or the 50% of uh, basketball players after their freshman year are going to put their name in the portal. Um, so why would I waste all that time and resources and money recruiting a high school kid when he's just going to transfer after a year? I don't like that. And I don't see us approaching it that way. Transfers for us are kind of hard to, for admissions anyway. Um, you know, we talk about how hard it is to get in here as a freshman, try getting in here as a transfer. Um, it can be a real challenge. And we don't do lower division transfers either. So those, those incoming sophomores don't really work for us. Um, so it's, it's going to be a real challenge, I think, to manage. I think our coaches are going to have to learn how to re-recruit. And what I mean by that is make sure our – freshmen want to stay I think you've seen John Smith do a pretty nice job of that uh keeping he's one of the few basketball programs that hasn't had a mass exodus you know I'll make it up I think Long Beach had seven or eight guys transfer out uh Irvine women's basketball essentially lost their entire starting five um you know that hasn't happened to us I hope we provide a much better experience than what others can uh with our location with the type of university we are but the people that we have uh, I'm hoping we are able to minimize that. So there's going to be some re-recruiting that has to happen for sure in terms of season's over. We have to sit down. You know, we want we want them to stay. What are we doing? Well, it's it's a recruiting pitch all over again about how we're going to treat them and what we're going to do and reminding them of what we've already done. Um, it's a rude awakening sometimes. The grass isn't always greener. And when somebody feels like they're transferring because they're not getting utilized the way they want, when they transfer, they usually find out it's the exact same situation wherever they go. They're not being utilized because, you know, you're, you're not developed in a certain area. Let's say soccer, for example. Um, you know, when you arrive at the next school, you've got that exact same impairment and nothing's going to change. So they realize it's, it's really about them. Your baggage goes with you. Well, no, many players at, at, at this level who are you know, all-conference, all-American caliber players, you go to – what some would consider a bigger program and all of a sudden your roles decreased and, and you start looking around and uh, you're, you're not in charge like you were at, at the other spot. And I think we've yeah. seen that a little bit uh, from, from ex Cal Poly athletes that, that decide they want to go elsewhere. So uh, obviously maybe a blueprint for uh, the coaches at Cal Poly now to say, you know, if, if you, if you think you can go jump to a better situation, you might want to think about that twice because uh, you have it pretty good here. Don Oberhelman is with us, the Cal Poly Athletics Director, as we talk about the year that was in Cal Poly Athletics uh, facilities 
Uh, anything brewing for you guys right now? Obviously, we just got done with, with a full baseball schedule, a lot of home games, more than 30 at Baggett Stadium this year. I walk into that ballpark, and, and I've been doing games here since 2016, but I walk into that ballpark, and it feels like I am calling professional baseball. I feel like that that has everything that a high-end minor league park would have, uh, from the, the scenery of the field itself to uh, the bleachers and the beautiful clubhouse down the third base left field line, the bullpens. I mean, Baggett Stadium is, is truly a premier facility on the West Coast for baseball. You just added the turf to Spanos. I think that is a tremendous addition. Obviously, the, the Door family field has been great for your soccer and football teams as well. Uh, what's, what's next in terms of, of facilities and, and what you guys are thinking about for the future of Cal Poly Athletics? Yeah, well, we've, you know, the, the minute you stop working on your, on your facilities is when you get left behind. And uh, I think we spent some years here at Cal Poly not really worried too much about our facilities. And uh, the last eight or nine years, I think we've really picked that up. Um, so we, we've actually got a lot on the drawing board right now. Um, we've already announced our, I think it's about a $7 million build for our men's and women's tennis programs. Uh, that we're we're wrapping up fundraising for that. That's going to um, be similar to it. I, I I will call it a mini Dignity Health baseball clubhouse. Um, that'll be a little bit smaller than that. Obviously, it serves a much smaller population. It'll serve twenty instead of forty uh, student athletes. But uh, it'll be a great opportunity for our great recruiting opportunity for our, our two tennis coaches. Um, tremendous way to develop our tennis players. Um, a true clubhouse kind of like what we have for baseball. Um, certainly we have some things we need to wrap up at Jansen field uh, for a softball program. I think we've got some seating things that we need to figure out in terms of what the bleachers look like. Uh, and certainly their clubhouse is, is going to need a renovation. Um, and then obviously the, the, the big question that everybody wants to talk about that I can't quite answer just yet is football. Uh, we'll, we'll be making a formal announcement as we get closer to the fall um, on what, what some of the facility enhancements are going to look like down at Spano Stadium, uh, benefiting our football program. And that's going to be a game changer for us. Um, there's been a couple of programs in the big sky that have already gotten underway. Montana State built something really, really nice. Weber State has built something really nice. Uh, Davis is in the works. I think it's under construction. Uh, what we have envisioned is going to outpace all of those. Uh, facilities and I think give our coaches a real opportunity to compete for national championship, which is why we brought Bo Baldwin in to begin with. Uh, that facility will, will make a world of difference for us. Last thing for you, Don. Uh, expectations as you look ahead, 2022, 2023. We've talked about the open positions. We've talked about the new hires. So th there's going to be a, a new culture for a lot of these programs looking ahead to the next athletic year. Bo Baldwin finally gets a, an uninterrupted full <laughs> offseason. Uh, what, what are your expectations for the football program and, and his third year at the helm, third season, if you will? I mean, really, it's the second season. And, and, and in a lot of ways, it's kind of like 2.0, 1A, 1B type of, of seasons for Bo because you, you had that three-game spring last year and then you had an interrupted summer session before the fall. Uh, and, and obviously, the hope is, can we avoid the COVID cancellations uh, for 22-23? I mean, what are your expectations as you look ahead? Well, that's the great uncertainty. I mean, we, we just had a, a very depressing meeting earlier in the week about COVID protocols and what it might look like um, for the fall in the state of California. Obviously, most decisions don't get made on our campus level. Um, you know, it's, it's concerning because I, I am so ready for us to be business as normal. Uh, but I, I think we got some work to do there um, about what the vaccine, what the vaccine requirement, sorry, what the vaccine requirements are going to look like uh, for state schools is still a little bit up in the air. So we, we got a lot to resolve there. Um, but I think we have to enter it assuming we're going to be business as usual. Let's get after it. Let's get to work. Um, right now, we got this little lull that you mentioned. Graduation just happened. A lot of our student athletes have gone home for this week. Uh, but you know what, a couple hundred of them will be right back here next week is uh, not only summer classes, but workouts. Uh, the NCAA has changed the rules quite a bit on what those what they look like. So for basketball, they call it summer access, which means um, they get to practice. They get to practice quite a bit in the summer. I can't remember how many days, but they'll be here. Men's and women's basketball engaged in workouts. Football will be here engaged in workouts. 
Um, they're not they're they're not full on practices, granted, but their workouts and they're a lot of time in the weight room, a lot of time on the court, a lot of time on the field, um, which will allow us, I think, to be a little bit better prepared when the season start. But everybody's doing that. So um, what I think it does allow us some time to do is bond with those incoming freshmen because they'll all be reporting here this coming week. Um, you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to steal one thing talking football. I'm going to steal the. Uh, my favorite marketing campaign involving my favorite athlete of all time, Bo knows. So we hired Bo, Bo knows how to win, Bo knows how to win national championships, Bo knows how to win big sky championships. Um, we're gonna put our trust in Bo. Um, you know, he's, he's put together a really good staff. He's put together a really good recruiting class for that program. It's just continuous improvement. That's all we're looking for right now is continuous improvement. Um, I wouldn't put it outside the realm of possibility that we contend for a big sky title pretty quickly. Uh, whether that's this year or next, it's hard for me to say. I think I need, we need to see some talent get developed, which is another thing I think Coach Baldwin is really, really good at. Um, Cooper Cup was not a highly recruited receiver, and that's what everybody wants to talk about. But Bo can talk about 40 other guys like that that were all big sky performers um, that they developed at Eastern Washington, um, guys that he developed at Cal. Um, we'll be doing that here. Uh, he's going to bring in some guys that uh, may be undersized and they're going to spend a, a summer in the weight room and put on 30 pounds of muscle and all of a sudden they're division one football players. As always, we'd like to thank our supporters, AM Sun Solar. If you're worried about rising PG&E rates, go solar, pay less on your monthly bills. Visit amsunsolar.com, your local solar experts. Podcast brought to you by Dignity Health, offering all-star treatment you can trust Learn more about healthcare services. Visit dignityhealth.org slash Central Coast. You've been watching and maybe listening to the Cal Poly Mustang Insider from Learfield. This has been the Mustang Insider Show presented by Cal Portland with a commitment to environmental leadership that has made the organization stronger and is the primary choice of contractors. The Mustang Insider Show. The preceding has been a Learfield presentation on the Cal Poly Sports Network.